Why don't we do this? Get up on your feet. Give a big West Texas Summit Church welcome to Pastor Jesse McCall. Pastor David, I, I, I've always, you know, said this. It's like, I think we're family, you know, and uh, that's really what it feels like. And thank you guys so much for the investment that you guys have made uh, over the years into the work of God in Cambodia, uh, into my wife and I personally, into our leaders there, and into the whole team. And uh, just love to bring you a good news report that it's been a, a really good investment and that uh, we're seeing a nation changed. Amen. Thank you again this morning. And uh, so good to uh, be able to just be here. Looking forward to the next four hours of inductive Bible study that we're going to have here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, sometimes uh, coming, uh, coming from Cambodia, where I've been since 1995, and uh, we're not the most sophisticated people there. Uh, I do believe we have kind of the the book of Acts factor, and I'll, maybe I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, but sometimes coming uh, back to a place like here in Canyon can feel a bit intimidated. Uh, you know, I'm not the most sophisticated person myself either, uh, but I do have a PhD, and that's prayer, healing, and deliverance. So you got that. My wife sometimes thinks it might be permanent head damage, but it's not. No, it's a <laughs> But uh, just bring you greetings from uh, our congregation there. And uh, like Pastor David said, my name is Jesse. I'm originally from the States here, originally from uh, Oregon. Lived there for the first 17 years of my life. And there's a whole story of kind of what happened at 17 years old. And uh, God did a pretty significant work in my life uh, around that time and I ended up in Cambodia and uh, that's been home ever since and uh, uh, my wife is Cambodian her name is uh, Soar S-O-A-R Soar like an eagle and uh, two kids Jessica and Josiah Soar and I've been married 18 years going on 19 years and I just have the privilege of uh, being part of like I said, uh, really what I believe is a move of God, and I don't use that word lightly, uh, but, but there's a move of God happening in Cambodia, and uh, it's significant. Uh, this is not, uh, we, we don't see this happening uh, every day uh, in the nations, and so it's just real Kairos time for the, the, the people and uh, for the nation of Cambodia. It's a great opportunity uh, for us as the larger body of Christ to say, what if God were still in the nation-changing business? Maybe he's not out of the nation-changing business. Maybe he's still in the nation-changing business, and how can we get in on this, right? And so uh, that's kind of my paradigm. I've, I've been there since 95, and uh, pastor New Life Fellowship, uh, which is a church in the city, and uh, we have seen, uh, man, I, I, I can't... T I can't begin to tell you just, you know, the stories of people's lives changed and impact in the, in the city and impact in the nation. And then out of that church, many years ago, we began planting churches. Um, like I said, Cambodia, uh, until very recently, has really been an unreached nation. And so when I talk about planting a church, uh, we're talking about radical conversions, first-generation believers, trained up, raised up, two-year-old believers learning how to pastor a church in their completely unreached community. And so uh, when we talk about starting a congregation of believers uh, in a community, for frame of reference, we're talking about there since Adam and Eve until those people came to the Lord, there probably had never been a Christian witness in those communities. And, uh, and so we have now, we have 250 churches all across Cambodia. Uh, we have seven generations of church plants. And uh, it really is just the book of Acts. I mean, I, I, could, I could tell you stories all day, just, just stuff that's happened uh, this year, entire households coming to the Lord. Uh, we had uh, just heard recently there was uh, one household, and the lady uh, was kind of a, a witch doctor, fortune teller type lady. 
and I got really sick, and she did everything she knew how to do to get better, and uh, all the, both the, the, the medical side of things, as well as kind of all the incantations and all of that that she uh, was familiar with, and uh, just got worse and worse. Long story short, uh, her last resort was, well, maybe Jesus can help me, and maybe those Christians might have something, but I really don't want to humble myself and go over there, but I'm kind of at my last uh, resort here, and I uh, got radically set free, delivered, saved, and she was a very influential person in that whole community, and so we're seeing a, a move of God just in that community where the church is just multiplying and growing, people being added to the church all the time. So just cool stuff like that. Can I, can I, can I encourage you this morning that uh, the book of Acts is still valid for today? Yeah, it's still valid for today. It really is. Uh, and what I'd love to do this morning is I'll, I want to tell you some stories uh, from Cambodia. But uh, do you think that, that, that it would be okay if we did this? Is that as I begin to kind of share some different stories, some different testimonies, uh, could I ask this? Don't don't just say, well, that's amazing, you know, and I wish I lived over there in, in Cambodia. But what if we were to allow the Lord to just stir our faith a bit this morning? Is that okay? Yeah, stir our faith a bit this morning and not just say, well, good on those guys, good for those guys, you know, they're in Cambodia. Maybe someday I'll have a chance to experience it. But But what if God could just stir our faith a bit that, well, I think it's the same God that we're serving here in Canyon, and so, who knows, maybe, maybe God could, could add some of that to us here as well. Is that all right? Is that all right this morning? So, living in Cambodia uh, all of these years, uh, lots of, lots of uh, reasons to, to just praise God and glorify God for, for all the great things that he's doing. In particular, like I said, just seeing a nation transformed before our eyes uh, when we arrived there in Cambodia, it was less than 1% Christian. Uh, it's now over 4% Christian. We got a, a big goal to get to 10% here in the next few years, and we believe that's the tipping point. And uh, we believe that we can see another uh, South Korea story. You know, by the way, South Korea 60 years ago was less than 1%. Uh, now some stats say it's over 50% Christian. Uh, you know, the largest churches in the world, Young E. Cho and a million members in his church, you know, are in South Korea that 60 years ago, just a generation ago, were, was less than 1% Christian. And so why not Cambodia? Why can't we have another one of those stories in the nation of Cambodia? Uh, and so that's what we're believing for and uh, uh, lots of good things happening. But here's a, here's a few things that living in Cambodia all of these years that... Uh, I think the Lord has kind of helped me, a North American kid, moving there to Cambodia to to be able to pick up of what he's doing there in Cambodia, and uh, some observations, some some lessons learned. Uh, First thing, and you're familiar with the passage in uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 30, uh, Jesus is there, and uh, the children are coming to Jesus, and the disciples are trying to shoo him away. And Jesus says, uh, you know what, I don't know, that might be the wrong verse. That's definitely the wrong verse. That's a good verse, too, and uh, I'm sure it's related to something. But you're familiar with the passage, and I may have, I may have sent the wrong verse through when I sent it through. But uh, where Jesus says, surely I tell you, uh, that no man, no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless he becomes like a little child. You can't enter into the ways of the kingdom living. There's something called the kingdom of God, the, 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 the work of God and, and God's way of doing things. And it's different. It's a different lifestyle. Everyone, let's, can we say that? It's a different lifestyle. There's a different lifestyle than the norm. And it's called the kingdom of God. It's a different mindset. It's a different economy. It's a a whole different way of doing things. And and Jesus said, look, if you want to begin that lifestyle, and it's a journey of faith and trust and understanding kingdom principles, if you want to begin that lifestyle, you have to have faith like a little child. Everyone say childlike faith. 
You know, uh, I, I, I've discovered this, and, and I'll, and I'll kind of uh, expound on this with regards to Cambodia. In the West, I think uh, because of such a, a great emphasis that we've had on, on academics over so many years, uh, and, 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 you know, I kind of use that word sophistication, which is essential. But I think, I think what's happened in the West is reason and logic is first, and then faith can be second. And so if I can figure it out and it makes sense, then I'll believe it. And then I'll, I'll step out and then I'll trust. Where if you look at the Eastern world, the Eastern world, I'm not just talking about Christianity, but in, in general in the Eastern world, something doesn't have to be logical to be true. Uh, I took a trip to Singapore recently, and Singapore is an island state and an amazing economy. I mean, they're, they're you know, super wealthy, and you see people that are you know, millionaires, and they're highly sophisticated, and they're highly educated, but during Chinese New Year, they're in front of their house burning little paper houses to give to their dead ancestors. So here you have CEOs of very successful corporations. They know all the latest techniques and all of that, but yet somehow they're burning this little paper car and this paper house and this paper you know, money to send to their dead end. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense at all. But, but the kind of the, 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 the way the East is wired is it doesn't have to make sense to be true. Now, thank God that in the kingdom of God that we do have a God of order, right? And that truth is logical and reasonable. But I think what can happen is if we're not careful as believers, we make that our paradigm. That, well, I have to get it all figured out first, and then I'll believe. And that's not the way of the kingdom. Now, things will make sense later on. Thank God. And God will put the pieces together usually, eventually, and, and we'll start to understand it. But, you know, I, 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 was, I was talking late, uh, recently, and I was talking about how, how uh, when Peter was out there, and he'd just come in from a full night of, of fishing, right? And Jesus is there teaching on the shore. Jesus finishes up his teaching, and then Jesus says, Hey, Peter, why don't you push out the boat and let's go fishing? And I'll help you catch some fish. And here, you know, Jesus the carpenter, you know, instructing the, 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 the fishermen who, by the way, you know, Peter just got off work. He had the night shift. He's out there on the lake all night. He's tired. He wants to go home. He wants to go take a bath, go to bed. And here Jesus is saying, why don't you push out the boat and why don't you let down the nets? And, and remember, this is Peter's introduction to Jesus. This is where, just after this, Peter says, why don't you just give it all up and just become a fisher of men? And, and why did Jesus, why did Jesus, one, ask Peter to do something that he didn't want to do? He did not feel like doing it. Emotionally, I'm tired. Physically, I'm tired. I am not interested in going back on the lake. I just had a bad day, by the way, you know, and I didn't catch anything. And this is the end of my shift, not the beginning of my shift. And second, why did Jesus ask him to do something that wasn't logical? Jesus, hey, we were just out there, man, and there's nothing. And so what you're asking me to do doesn't make sense. Remember, this was Peter's introduction to the Christian walk. Why did Jesus ask him to do that? One, I think Jesus was going, was beginning to teach him how to be led by the Spirit rather than by his flesh. Look, if you're going to do this Christian journey, you got to figure out how to be led by the Spirit, not just by your emotions, not just by the current feeling of the moment. And so if you're going to become a fisher of men and a follower of Christ, you got to get this one down. And second, you're going to have to learn how to live by faith. And what I'm asking you to do doesn't make sense. It isn't logical. Now, now maybe later on it will make sense. And, you know, you could look at that and say, well, yeah, actually from a kingdom perspective, Peter had just kind of sown his boat to Jesus, 
and allowed Jesus to use his boat as a platform for preaching. And so there's a whole principle of this sowing and reaping. And so, of course, there's going to be a great catch of fish. But, but Peter didn't understand that. Peter didn't understand that, but Jesus was introducing him to the life of faith. Can we say that one more time? Childlike faith. So Jesus says, you can't enter into the ways of the kingdom unless you have faith like a little child. And, and we do have this in Cambodia. Uh, every April is Cambodian New Year. There's a, there's a picture kind of of what happens here at Cambodian New Year because uh, every April is a festive time. People go back to their hometowns. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a gathering of all the family members and the relatives. But it's also a very spiritual time. Because Cambodians believe that on the first day, the first morning of Cambodian New Year, which is in the middle of uh, April, it's a three-day festivity, they believe that the new angel will come to rule over the country. In fact, the national astrologers, based out of the royal palace there, they announce over the news, over the radio, over the TV, and they say, okay, tomorrow morning, April 14th at 6.04 a.m., the new angel's going to arrive. So every household, make sure you prepare your sacrifices. Prepare, yep, yeah, just this right here. Make sure you prepare your sacrifices to welcome the presence of this new angel, this new demonic principality, Prepare these sacrifices to welcome the presence of this spirit into your household. And across the country, across the country, every household is doing this. So we as believers, and, and with our congregation being first-time, first-generation believers, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a time where our hearts really go out to our fellow countrymen and to our loved ones and to our family members because we know that they're going to be welcoming this presence of this demonic principality into their lives and into their homes. And so we've countered that for several years. And uh, the night before the new angel comes and people welcome this new angel, they call it welcoming the new angel. The night before we have a welcome Holy Spirit service. And uh, it's a good old fashioned Holy Ghost service. Uh, but it's also a time of prayer and intercession where we're praying for our loved ones because we know tomorrow morning what they're going to be involved in. And, uh, and so it's a time of praying for the nation, praying for our loved ones. And so several years ago, we were having one of our Welcome Holy Spirit services the night before Cambodian New Year. And uh, we had uh, just a great time of prayer. And I kind of opened up the, the, the stage and the mic for anybody that uh, for that period of time just wanted to kind of lead us in, in, a, in a session of prayer. And so uh, some different people got up and began to pray for the nation. And a 12-year-old girl asked if she could come up and if she could lead a, a session of prayer uh, for the nation. Yeah, come on up. So she comes up and uh, she begins to pray. Father God, we just proclaim that Cambodia belongs to you. Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. And Father, we don't want the presence of this new angel in our nation. That's right. And so, Father God, we just ask that you would just kick it out and never let it come back in Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, the next day was the first day of Cambodian New Year when the angel comes Interestingly enough, the day after that, in the local news, newspapers, radio, media, you could ask a Cambodian about this. And uh, for the first time ever that I know of, and I believe it was the first time ever in Cambodia's history, the national astrologers made an announcement. The day after the angel was to come, they made an announcement and said, we don't know what happened this year, but the new angel didn't come. The new angel didn't come. And that thing, we don't know where it is and why it didn't come, but the new angel didn't come to Cambodia this year. I believe that principality was torn down <laughs> to the point where even the national, and these are people that are in touch with the spirit world, you know, and they kind of know what's going on there. 
And uh, they said, we need to try to re-celebrate Cambodian New Year and add a couple more days of festivity, see if we can get this thing to come. I believe since that point on where people have just been going through the, the, the motions, but I believe that thing was torn down. And uh, the, 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 the faith, the childlike faith of a little 12-year-old girl that nobody told her, you can't pray prayers like that. Who do you think you are? That's too big of a prayer. Why would God answer a prayer of yours like that? That's way too big. Nobody told her that was too big of a prayer. She had some childlike faith. How many here could say, I could use some more childlike faith, right? More childlike faith. Uh, one of our leaders uh, is uh, named Pastor Mara. And uh, Mara is just an amazing man of God. This is, this is Mara here. He's been with us since the very beginning. And uh, Mara, uh, he's an electrician by trade. Several years ago at uh, our building, we had an electrical short. And uh, we, uh, we had this electrical short. We didn't know uh, exactly where the problem was. By the way, the way they do electrical wiring in Cambodia is probably a bit different than here. Uh, and so we just, we just did not know where it was. We were trying to look in all the obvious spots, couldn't find it. And uh, the, the next step that we were going to have to take was we were literally just going to have to start pulling out of the, wire, the wires out of the wall, out of the floor, wherever they put them, until we found the short, uh, because the entire top floor of the building had no power. And uh, Mara was the, the guy that was kind of in charge of helping us do this, but Mara is a man of faith. Mara is one of those guys that he has that childlike faith. If you were to walk in this morning and you're maybe uh, kind of limping a little bit because you stubbed your toe on the way in, he would come up to you and say, hey, you know, I noticed you're limping. Is, is everything okay? Well, I just kind of stubbed my toe on the way, and I'm sure I'll walk it off. It'll be fine. No, 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 no. We're going to pray for healing right now. We're going to pray for your toe to be healed right this minute. Well, I'm sure if I walk it off. No, no, no. You're going to get a miracle right now. We're going to believe for your toe to be healed. That's the kind of faith that, that, that Mara has. And so we have this electrical short, no power, whole top floor, the next day, we were going to have to pull out all of the wiring until we could find it. So that night, uh, Mara prayed, God, would you help us with this? Would you help us with this electrical situation? And uh, that night, he had a dream. He had a dream that he went into one of the corners of the church building. He broke open one of the tile floor, floor panels there, and he found the short. So when he woke up the next morning, he went over to the same spot that he dreamed about, broke open the tile. I was actually downstairs, and he was upstairs, and I hear this shouting, Hallelujah! Wah, wah, wah. what in the world is going on? Well, he broke open the tile, found the short, solved the problem, just like that. Childlike faith. Childlike faith. Again, nobody told him, Mara, come on, you got, you know, got a good head on your shoulders, you got two hands, just solve the problem. Why have to bother God with this kind of stuff? You know, God's not interested in that kind of stuff. Nobody told him that. His assumption was, I serve a good God, I serve a big God, he's interested in the big stuff, he's also inter interested in the small stuff, and so yeah, I'm going to tap into this, and I'm going to anticipate that God's on my side, and that he's going to help us out with this. Amen? Is that okay this morning? How many here could say, I need some more childlike faith? Amen? I want to say a couple more things, but can we just pray for a moment? Father, we just ask, Father, whatever the barriers, whatever the hindrances would be, Father God, we thank you that there is a, a whole way of living in the kingdom of God that, that is contrary to what we see and contrary to so often what surrounds us, Father. And God, we, we, we all of us here today, myself included, all of us, we haven't tapped into the potential of what kingdom living looks like yet. There's so much more, God. And so, Father God, we just ask, oh God, for just a fresh touch, a fresh renewal of childlike faith, God. Father God, we thank you that we can trust you, Lord. We can trust your ways, Lord. Father God, we thank you that even if we don't understand it all, God, but we can, we can trust 
We can step out, Father. We can trust your way of doing things, God. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Another lesson learned in Cambodia is, uh, you know, when Jesus was in the boat, and or actually he was on the water, and the disciples were on the boat, and uh, Jesus is walking on water towards the disciples, and Peter says, Lord, is that really you? And Jesus said, yeah, that's me. And so Peter said, well, Lord, if it's you, would you call me out of the boat? And, uh, and we have the, 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 the amazing story of Peter stepping out of the boat, and he's walking on water. And, uh, you know, Peter knew, he knew a bit of physics, and he knew that, you know, this isn't supposed to be working this way, and I don't know how, you know, I've grown up on the water, and I know the difference between solid and liquid, and uh, I'm not sure how this is going to work, but, man, Jesus, if this is you, why don't you call me out to do something that I don't have completely figured out, but I'd love to do it. And uh, he steps out and begins to, to walk on water. Uh, this is what I've seen in Cambodia, and I believe that this is part of just kingdom living, is that we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to have all the answers, but we can step out on those words from God that God has spoken to us. We don't have to have all the answers. You know, I believe that Peter, he wasn't just walking on water. He was walking on that word of the Lord, where the Lord said, come. And he was walking on that word. And, and so oftentimes we, have, we feel like we have to wait till we have all the answers and to have everything lined up, don't we? Yeah, we feel like, all right, let me get all the answers first. And I, hey, stewardship is good and planning is good. And we got the whole book of Proverbs. And we have, in particular, wise counsel uh, to help us and, you know, different life decisions and all of that. This is all essential. But it doesn't negate the kingdom lifestyle of, all right, God's spoken, and I don't have it all quite figured out, but I'm going to step out in faith. Several years ago, uh, my wife and I were invited to a birthday party of an uh, of, uh, influential man there uh, in the city, and uh, he held his birthday party at a place that they call a beer garden. And uh, there's hundreds of these beer gardens all across the city, and uh, I'd never, my wife and I had never been in one, uh, but this is where he held his birthday party. And so we got there uh, in the evening uh, for this meal and uh, birthday celebration, and my wife and I were shocked because in just this particular beer garden, and there's hundreds of these all across the city, there were probably 80, 90 scantily dressed young women in there waiting for customers to bring them home for the night. And it, it, was, it was shocking. It was very eye-opening uh, for both of us. And, uh, you know, and thinking about that this is just one of hundreds of these places all across the city. And, and it, really, it really affected me and began to think, you know, so, so who are these young ladies and how did they end up in this, you know? And whether they were taken advantage of at some point, and then they just felt like, well, I'm, I'm dirty now, and I'm no good now, and that would be the, the mindset of society, is that, well, you're, once you're dirty, you're dirty for good, and so you might as well just go with, go, go with the flow, uh, whether some of them were tricked into it, whether some of them, they just felt like they had no options, uh, and, 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 and now they're in this lifestyle, and now society says you're no good, and you can never be good. And so this is your only identity. This is the only thing that you can do. And uh, it affected me so much that I actually uh, switched around what I was ministering on that coming Sunday. And I talked about this type of thing with our church. And I challenged our church. I said, church, what kind of church are we going to be? Are we going to be a church that can reach these types of people and other types of people that would be considered the outcast of society? Are we gonna be? Are we gonna be a church that knows how to reach people that they don't know the Christian lingo? If they come in here, they don't probably know how to dress, they don't know how to act, they don't know how to talk. But are we gonna welcome them in? Are we gonna tell them that there's a group of people that loves them, us, the church, 
and there's a God that loves them, and there's a way out, and the way out, his name is Jesus. And, uh, you know, I just challenge the church that we got to be that kind of church. After the service, a young lady came up and talked to me and my wife. Her name is uh, Solidan. And uh, I think I have a picture of Solidan, not this picture here. This is uh, another picture. Uh, I think she's there, we are. Solidan with her husband and two kids. Uh, Solidan uh, is from a farmer's family in the countryside, and uh, no Christians in her family. She moved to the city, uh, came to the Lord at New Life, and uh, ended up living in one of our dormitories. We have a ministry called Next Step Houses, which are dormitories uh, for young people. Got, got saved and uh, plugged into the church. And uh, she came and talked to my wife and I after that service. And she said, Pastor, what you shared about is something that's been on my heart. I, I want to figure out how to reach these young ladies. Now, at that time, Solida was 23, 24 years old, uh, didn't have a college degree. She's working uh, uh, in a factory. And uh, what you shared is, is really what's on my heart. And I want to figure out somehow, some way, how I could be part of reaching these ladies. So we prayed over her, and uh, for the next several months, close to a year, she began to pray, she began to talk, she began to figure out what she could figure out, and uh, a year later, she quit her job, and she started a nonprofit called Precious Woman. And uh, Precious Woman is a, non, a Christian nonprofit organization there, that uh, they go to the girls in the bars, in the clubs, in the beer gardens, and they tell these girls, look, there's people that love you, that genuinely love you. Those people are called the Christian community and the church. And, and there's a God that loves you. And, and you may think there's not a way out, but there is a way out. And we want to help you if you want out. We have a place for you to stay. And we have skills training. And we won't judge you. We'll love you. And we'll help you out. And we'll walk with you. And... She has, to this day, she has helped hundreds and hundreds of young ladies. She has a weekly radio program now that she does. And uh, so many of these young ladies are plugged into our church now and other churches uh, across the country. And uh, she started this great ministry, Precious Woman. And uh, a while back, she was uh, sitting in our living room, and she was talking to my wife and I. My wife's on her board. And uh, she said, she said, Pastor, I don't know what I'm doing. She said, I've never done this before. <laughs> she said, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this. She said, all I know is that God spoke to me, and I stepped out on that word from God. Amen? This is the Christian life. This is the norm. Can, can I say, this is the normal Christian life. This isn't, actually, this isn't the abnormal Christian life. This is the normal Christian life. God speaks, and we get some wise counsel, and, you know, especially the wise counsel of leadership and, and, and the church here, uh, that's essential, and you do what you can do, and then you got to take some steps, and you got to step out on those words. What are, what are some of the words that God's spoken to you? What are some of the things that, that God has been speaking to you and and maybe there's that kind of hesitancy and that fear factor of, man, I don't have it all figured out. And uh, can I tell you that even in this upcoming season and this upcoming year, God will speak things to you as well. There's going to be things that God will speak and you may feel intimidated. You may feel a bit uncomfortable, but that's okay. He's a good God. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He's with us. He believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And the normal Christian life is to step out on those words from God. Amen? Is that all right, everyone, this morning? Is that all right? I'd love to just uh, in encourage you. that You can do it. God is on your side. And those things that he has spoken or those things that he will speak, you can step out. And he is a faithful God. He is a good God. He will guide and direct. And by the way, if, if you make a couple mistakes along the way, don't beat yourself up over it. 
Because I, I think we have a gracious God that he's, he's, he is so pleased as we're trying to figure out this journey of faith, right? And at least we're trying to hear and trying to be sensitive and trying to go that direction. And if we make a couple little mistakes here and there, he's a good God. He's going to run to us. He's going to pick us up. He's going to clean us up and say, keep on going. I believe in you, son. I believe in you, daughter. Amen. Final thing. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, talks about what God has entrusted to us, what God has deposited into our lives. Talks about the, the light of the gospel, the light of the life of God that God has put in us. How, ma- how many have received that, that, that life of God into us? Amen. Isn't he a good God? Isn't he? He's just such a good God. And he has, he has you know, the transformation and, and that life that he has deposited into us. He's he, he, so much goodness and faithfulness and love that he has put in us. But then it, it also mentions that that treasure, it's actually in some very fragile, maybe damaged, maybe kind of cracked jars of clay. An amazing treasure, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the loving kindness of God. But he's put it in our fragile beings, in our broken beings. And what I'd love to just tell you, and and just coming firsthand from Cambodia, a nation of broken people, people that have seen all kinds of devastation have been through all types of atrocities. But can, can I let you know that God's light can still shine through our brokenness? I would reckon, I, I would reckon that all of us in this room, even those of us that have everything together, which I don't think there's anyone that has everything together, right? But even for, for all of us, we all have some areas of brokenness. We all have some areas that we wish it were a bit better. We wish it hadn't quite gone that way, and we wish that things had worked out differently. But, but can, I just, can I just encourage you this morning? God's light can shine through our brokenness. God's light can shine through our brokenness. This is uh, this, this young lady that was put up earlier, Panya, the, the black and white photo. This is Panya. Panya uh, is an orphan. From uh, as, as early as she can remember, she, uh, she lived in a few different households with people. She, she has no idea who her parents are. And uh, she lived in households with people. And she remembers at an early age that uh, the way that some of these people treated her was just terrible. She said she was living with one family as a little girl. They had children of their own. And uh, they had her living there at the house. And while the family ate dinner at the table or ate meals at the table, they put her food down with the dogs to eat off the floor. They said at times they chained her up in the house uh, when they were disappointed with her behavior. And uh, who knows what other atrocities and hurts and abuses she went through uh, as a little girl. She eventually ended up in a government orphanage, and a government orphanage in a place like Cambodia is not a place that you want to grow up. Uh, You talk about love and nurture and care. There's none of that there. It's really just a group of kids kind of surviving in an institution. And uh, that's where she grew up. She uh, contemplated and attempted suicide several times before the age of 18, uh, growing up uh, in, in this orphanage. And uh, when she was 18, she had to leave the orphanage. This is one of the reasons that we have our dormitories, our next step houses, because it's the next step for, for kids that are coming out of the, these types of institutions. And so she, uh, she left the orphanage when she was 18, and she uh, went to live with a family that uh, allowed her to live at their house if she did, did some of the cooking and the cleaning. And uh, that's when we came across Banya. And... Uh, 
we came across her because uh, someone in that neighborhood was part of our church, and they had met Tanya, and they said, Pastor, it seems like she's in a not very good situation, and uh, there could be current or potential abuses happening uh, with that family that she's living with. Uh, do we have anything that we could do to help her out? So uh, when she was about 19 years old, my wife and I actually got her out of that house, and she came and lived at our house uh, for a period of time and uh, was just part of our family for a period of time, and then uh, we got her into our, our dormitories. And uh, Panya would be the first to tell you that she's had a lot of hurt. She's had a lot of disappointment. Uh, she's had a pretty rough life, and everything that she's gone through in life, it would be so easy for her to just be a bitter, angry, negative young lady. It would be so easy for her to be a lady, a young, a young lady that is just mad at the world, full of hate, full of anger, full of bitterness, hopeless. But you know what? Fania is one of the brightest, most loving young ladies you'll ever be around. She's the kind of young lady that when she walks in the room, the whole room brightens up. I was just chatting with her just a couple days ago. And she is so full of joy. She, she, she is so encouraging. And uh, she, uh, uh, until just a little while ago, she was working uh, in a children's center and uh, helping other children, uh, helping children uh, from poor backgrounds and giving them hope and giving them a future and giving them education. Now recently, uh, she's gone back to school and she's uh, getting some more education as well as uh, she's, uh, she's kind of got a social media presence now that uh, she's developing and seeing what that would, may turn into. But she's got her brokenness. She's got her hurt and her disappointments. But she's allowing the light of God to shine through her despite her brokenness. We can all do this, folks. Sometimes we can so easily get to a place where, well, God can't use me because of everything that I've been through or everything that I'm going through. And can I let you know that's, that's not our God? That's not the way he functions. That he can shine through us despite what you're currently going through or even what you've already gone through. His light shines through these broken vessels. Amen? One final story. Uh, I told you about uh, Pastor Mara, and uh, Pastor Mara helped us plant our first church outside the city uh, in the rural areas of Cambodia. And so uh, a, a province called Kampung Tom province, it was about a four-hour drive on terrible roads, and uh, we had just a cool story of how this whole community opened up. And uh, basically the way the community opened up is a young lady from that community came to the city, got saved in our church, and uh, there's no Christians in her community, no believers in her community. And uh, after being in our church a couple years, she wanted to go back to her village uh, to help out uh, with the family farm there. So we loaded her up with some Bibles. We loaded her up with some tracts and uh, said, all right, you're going as a missionary because you're the only Christian there. And uh, she went back, and she wrote us a letter a couple months later. Uh, it sounded like one of Paul's epistles. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace be with you. And uh, she began to tell us how her dad, who was an alcoholic, uh, had since given up drinking and been completely set free, and how her cousin, who was the village demoniac, the village demon-possessed kid tormenting the village, uh, how she cast the demons out of him in the name of Jesus, and he was set free. And now all the people in that community really want to know more about this Jesus. Can you guys send help, please? And so, so that's how our first church plant outside the city started in one of the rural areas. And so Pastor Mara would go up there. My wife would go up there, and they would drive four hours up every Thursday uh, most of the people in the beat-up four-wheel drive vehicle that we had would get car sick on the way up, and 
uh, then they'd get there in the village, and they'd build relationships, and they'd share Jesus, and that turned into Bible studies. And then they'd drive four hours back uh, every Thursday, and Mara was the team leader for that. And uh, there'd be some weeks where he would stay up there on the Thursday evening, and he'd catch a taxi back Friday uh, when the rest of the team went back. And it was an area that wasn't that safe back in the late 90s there. And, uh, but he wanted to reach the people that couldn't join the Bible study during the day. He wanted to have kind of a nighttime Bible study with the people there. And so if you can imagine, you know, hot, humid, bugs, you know, dark, one little light bulb hanging down and some people sitting on some plastic chairs. And here Mara is, you know, sharing Jesus with people and praying with people and doing these Bible studies with people. And, uh, and, and he's got so many stories to tell. He told me one time, by the way, it's just kind of a funny story. He said he was so exhausted from the day. You know, it's hot, humid, long drive up there. He said one time he was sitting up there teaching the Bible study, uh, sitting there, it's dark, one little light bulb hanging down, that he fell asleep while he was teaching the Bible study. <laughs> but he kept on talking. He kept on talking for about 30, 40 seconds. And then he came to, and, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I'm sorry. No, and they all said, it was okay, Pastor, it was good. It just got a little bit slow, but it was still good. <laughs> uh, but Mara would go up there with the team every week. And uh, there was one guy that began to come and join the Bible study. His name was Horn. And Horn began to join the Bible study. Horn's background was that when he was a young adolescent, 13 or so years old, that's when the war started. And they were recruiting anybody to be soldiers. And so he became a child soldier when he was about 13 years old. He didn't really have the rest of his childhood to enjoy. And from the age of 13 onwards, he was killing people, seeing people killed, in this war, and, uh, you know, his friends and his fellow uh, teammates there, all kinds of atrocities that he went through. He never got to enjoy his teenage years. He never got to enjoy an education. Uh, he came from uh, a very broken family uh, in the first place. And then when the war began to finish up, the government began laying off uh, a lot of soldiers, and so they were out of a job. And, uh, and so he and some other former soldiers decided to create a kidnapping gang. And uh, they created a kidnapping gang, and that's how they earned their income. Up in that region, they would kidnap people, hold them for ransom, get the ransom, and then they'd have some money to live off of. And uh, so Horn heard about this Bible study of this guy driving some kind of four-wheel drive vehicle up there, uh, there weren't too many cars back then, and so he must be pretty wealthy if he's driving a vehicle. And I uh, heard he works for some kind of group in Phnom Penh. I'm not sure if it's a, a nonprofit or what it is, but I'm sure they have some money. And so I hear he has these things that he does, these Bible studies in the evenings. I'm going to go and sit in the back, watch his movements with the intention of kidnapping him. So here Mara is teaching these Bible studies, and Han is sitting in the back of these Bible studies week after week, following his movements, looking for an opportunity, creating a plan to kidnap Mara. Mara didn't know this. Mara didn't know who this man was. He was just one of the guys in the Bible study. Well, what ended up happening is that after several weeks of him sitting in this Bible study, following the movements, the message of the gospel got through to him. He ended up giving his life to the Lord, got radically saved. Yeah. Not only that, and this is a picture of Hon. Uh, this is a picture of him. And then this next picture is a picture of him with his family now. Uh, and Hon is one of our pastors up there now. He's pastoring our church up there. He's kidnapping people for Jesus now. <laughs> and Hon here, he... He had a tough life. He had a tough childhood. He had a tough adolescent years, teen years. He could be very disappointed about a lot of things. But you know what? In the community up there where Horn is pastoring his church, 
he is known as one of the most cheerful, kindest, most friendly people in that whole region. That's how he's built his church, is he's just known as a loving guy. He's the kind of guy that you can't get around without getting a hug. That's the kind of guy he is. Because he's allowed the light of the goodness of God, the love of God, the faithfulness of God to shine through him despite all of his brokenness. Amen? Amen? And I know, you know, we could do a raise of hands and, and all of that, but I know that all of us, there's been stuff that hasn't quite worked out the way we wanted it to work out. But can I just challenge you? Can I just challenge you this morning? Don't let that hinder the goodness of God from shining through you. Amen? Even this week, in this upcoming week, come on, let the praises of God be on our lips. Come on, this, 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 this upcoming week, why don't we just, why don't we be kind of maybe the, the, the people with some of the biggest smiles in town this week, right? Does that mean we got it all going good? No, that doesn't mean that. But what if we were the people that left the biggest tips when we go out to eat, right? And we were the, known as the most encouraging people when we get to the service station and fill up and, and we go into the grocery store and in our daily lives, what if we were to just be known as people that we, we go through stuff just like everyone else sometimes. But hold on, we got, we, got, we got this treasure in us. Man, he has been good to me. And he has never let me down. And he has never forsaken me. And there's a lot of good stuff in store as well. And I may be going through this valley of the shadow of death. That's okay, I'm going to come through it. And he's going to be on my side. And he's got a table prepared before me. You know what? I got a lot that I can be thankful for right? I got a lot that I can be encouraging to others, and I'm going to let that light shine through me to everyone around me. In Jesus' name, amen. Could I just pray with you this morning? We just pray together. Father God, we just thank you, God. Father God, I just ask this morning,